Andy, my dude, have you heard of the magical website builder known as Squarespace? Ugh, not another Squarespace ad. I feel like every podcast is sponsored by them. <laughs> Hey, don't knock it till you try it. Yes, okay, it is overhyped. But actually, it lives up to the hype. Squarespace is like a website fairy godmother. With a click of a button, your site transforms into a beautiful masterpiece. A website fairy godmother? That sounds interesting. What makes it so magical? Well, for starters, those slick templates make anyone look like a professional web designer. Pick one, customize the colors and fonts to match your brand, and voila! Plus, the drag-and-drop fluid engine is so easy, your grandma could build a site on Squarespace. Well, she did knit me a lovely scarf last Christmas. Maybe website design is next. Exactly. And when you're ready to sell your Nana's handmade scarves online, Squarespace has built-in e-commerce. Add a store with one click, get flexible payment options, then watch those sales roll in. And when she wants to teach others her steezy scarf skills, Squarespace's new courses feature is just the ticket. Nana can set up her curriculum and enrollments and payments in a snap and become the next e-knitting influencer. Oh, wow, you really sold me with the grandma angle. Sign me up for that free try. Just go to the nextreel.com slash Squarespace and transform your site into a beautiful Squarespace masterpiece. Well, thanks, Pete. Even though it's overhyped, Squarespace actually sounds perfect for Nana's site's needs. Appreciate the warning on the ads, though. I'll brace myself next time I listen to a podcast. Anytime. Let me know if you need any help getting that site up and running. Andy, can you believe we've almost hit 700 episodes of The Next Reel? I know, it's crazy. And with all the other episodes in our family of podcasts, we are well over 1,200 episodes of movie conversation. It's really pretty amazing that we've gotten to have these in-depth movie chats every week for over a decade now. And we couldn't have done it without our loyal community of film fans. Their support over the years has meant so much. For sure. That reminds me, we should give the merch store a shout out. Buying shirts from thenextreel.com slash merch is a great way listeners can continue to support the show. Plus, they get to sport our great designs. Absolutely. I think sometimes folks forget we have a variety of shirts, mugs, phone cases, and more available. In fact, a great place to start is with a shirt sporting the Next Reel's logo. We also have that classic Fast Times Spicoli Surf School tee, or the weirdly popular Rusty's European Tour shirt. The one from National Lamp Foods European Vacation. Why is that so popular? <laughs> Search me, but we have sold a ridiculous number of those. I guess there are a lot of Rusties taking trips to Europe? We're always adding new designs based on movies we've covered, like our brand new design for a streetcar named Desire, featuring a streetcar named Desire. So if you want to rep your love of TNR and films, head to thenextreel.com slash merch. Every purchase helps us continue to have these weekly in-depth conversations. So visit thenextreel.com slash merch today. And as always, thanks for listening and being a part of the Next Real community. We've got lots more great movie chats coming your way. I'm Pete Wright. And I'm Andy Nelson. Welcome to The Next Reel. When the movie ends, our conversation begins. In just a matter of seconds, you're going to hear a classic episode of this show from back in the day when we called ourselves Movies We Like. It took us a while to settle into the show's format, so you'll notice some differences as you listen to these episodes. For instance, it takes us a bit of time to actually get into the conversation about the movie. Things like that. But we're still proud of the conversations about the movies themselves, and we think they're worth keeping in the library. So enjoy these episodes from our back catalog. And you can become part of our Discord community, learn more about the show, and find out how you can become a supporting member at thenextreel.com. So thank you, everybody, for downloading and listening to The Next Reel. We appreciate your time and attention, and we hope you enjoy the show. From the Delta to the DMZ. <laughs> oh, there's an interesting <laughs> I'm not going to say anything because you're just going to do it again <laughs> I'm, I'm just messing with you if I, if I could sing in French I yeah. would do it but really really slowly you would, what would you do in French what are you talking about sing in French why would you sing, sing. in French oh uh, but yeah I know you know. You know. I, now I do. Now I know. Oh.
Believe me, Andy, I always know. Non je ne regret rien. I don't know how you say that. Is, is that close? I don't know. I don't know my French. Yeah. What is yeah. that? I, I regret. I never regret anything. I regret nothing. Yes, I think that's it. No, I do not regret anything. Yeah, that's a story. Man, if I had a dime. <laughs> um, how are you? How in the hey who are you? It has been way too long since I've talked it, to you. It's you know, like easily like thirty-seven it's, hours. I feel like it's. I feel like it's been at least forty. Anything Ooh. changed for you since then? No, no, just you know. I mean, we were sitting in the car, marveling at how hot it was. I hate you outside. <laughs> I guess it's it's like summer weather in Colorado. Like literally, we we're sitting outside eating lunch today, going, God, "We need to go inside. It is just too hot out here." <laughs> <laughs> Have they turned on the uh, area sprinklers? Uh, not, those not, on, not not quite. like patio not eating. You know, you get your mm-hmm. area. Oh, Do you yeah. have those on your patio? Patio sprinklers? Uh, not on my own patio. Oh well, see, so you, you're missing that. That's why we have a pool. We just oh, jump great. in it and <laughs> cool down in that. We jump in it and then spit on each other. <laughs> it's almost the that's same a, thing. That's Arizona. Oh, Welcome to the next reel, everybody. I'm Pete Wright. That there's Andy Nelson. Say hello to the people, Andy. Woohoo. And we spoil movies heartily. And you can find us at thenextreel.com where you can read the kindly blog stylings of the one Steve Sarmento. You can catch up with all of the past films we've done on The Next Reel, the weekly show, and all of the monthly episodes that we do with the Film Board of current release awesome films. Except for most of the ones we choose are not. Uh, <laughs> and so just be ready for that. That's right. uh, you can catch up with us on all of the assorted social platforms uh, to join the conversation. Facebook, Google+, Plus, Twitter. Uh, you can find all that information on the website. Most importantly, if you want to catch up with the movies we're talking about, we're on letterboxd.com slash the next reel. And you can see our watch list and see every single movie we're going to talk about in this fine year of 2014. Mm-hmm. Uh, and with that, how are we doing so far? on Andy versus the people. You know, I, I, I started off pretty good this week. I did. I really <laughs> did start off pretty good. I was stumped. Yeah, I, I seemed to stump quite a few. You know, it kind of goes and this is how it seems to go. I, I stump people for a few days and then all of a sudden somebody just nails it. And You know, like, uh, like I told Cameron Ryan, who ended up winning again, this past week she must study movie architecture because both the firm and this once she saw the house she knew yeah. exactly what movie it was so so yes congratulations to cameron she uh, is entered to win the pony prize for winning this week which was blades of glory blades of glory and i still didn't get it with the house like i'm looking at the house right now and i don't get it oh i had a lot of other great pictures to use that i think were pretty obscure <laughs> <laughs> and I thought the house was pretty obscure. So this was a case of just you maybe not ordering right. Uh, I, if it weren't maybe. for that damned student of cinema architecture. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations, Cameron Ryan. Thank you so much yes. for playing. As always, I love that smoothie shot. Uh, you know, thirsty. It was fooling people. Yeah, that, that was, was the whole goal. That was aces. You? Aces. Uh, And uh, so that's good. So you got to join that. And when you join that, you join the Pony Prize, which will not win you a pony, but it will win you a a collection of obscure and eccentric movie gifts uh, that are going to be coming your way sometime before 2018. And that is also sarcasm. And you will enter to win, uh, to be drawn, (laughs) you will enter to be drawn (laughs) as a fine sketch. With maybe some chalk. Uh, you will enter a drawing uh, to become our next listener's choice. Is that right? That is correct. Yeah, we're going to do the drawing in early April, and then we'll record the film, the podcast about the film, in late April. So we are collecting all the names of people who play along on the Instagram um, Guess the Movie Challenge, all the people who leave us comments on Facebook, on iTunes, everywhere. So yes. all those names will be thrown into a great big hat. It's sort of a modest-sized hat. I mean, it's not. It's, right, it's yeah. a bigger hat. A little it's bit. It's big bigger. for All me, right. but there are yeah. people who could wear this hat. <laughs> there 
are people <laughs> with big heads. <laughs> Biggish. Let's do trailers. I'm going to go first. I can't believe I haven't seen this movie coming because, you know, I, I have this thing with John Cusack. I like him. He's on my list of best friends who haven't met me yet. Uh, and um, I, I don't know much from Rebecca DaCosta in terms of whether she would be on that list or not. feel like I don't know her quite well enough. Uh, Dominic Purcell, you know, I, I like this uh, Dominic Purcell. You know where, where we know him from, right? Where? What? Prison Break and John Doe. Very short-lived uh, uh, character with no memory, <laughs> but mostly he was in prison break for a long time. So I'm, you know, we've, we've he's he's been my buddy for a while, my my entertainment buddy, and now uh, it's better to say that than your prison buddy. <laughs> <laughs> That's horrible. And now John Cusack and Rebecca DaCosta and uh, 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 Dominic Purcell join the fine curmudgeonly Robert De Niro in The Bagman. Directed and uh, by David Grovich, written by David Grovich and Paul Conway and others. Um, I this uh, apparently the story was written by Mary Louise von Franz, inspired by the story the the cat right, that she wrote apparently. So anyway, so this is uh, this looks pretty good, right? You watch the trailer. It looks it looks pretty you know like a little bit of a. <laughs> You know, good heist slash mystery slash maybe some psychological elements thrown in. It's it a Mag- my it, curiosity. It's a MacGuffin movie. It is a MacGuffin. It's movie. a giant MacGuffin. It's a bag. How much mm. you want to bet? It doesn't matter what's in the bag. Well, he even says, "Don't look in the bag. It's death." <laughs> <laughs> oh, I guess we already know. <laughs> Spoiler: Death, death in, the is in the bag. I should have just called it that. <laughs> Dead, <laughs> death is in this bag. <laughs> it doesn't. Not that it matters, but death is in the bag. <laughs> uh, it, there is a you know by the end of the trailer. What, what is it? you? You don't want to know what's in this bag. I do. I really want to know what's in the bag. I'm going to see this movie when it comes out on February 28th, 2014, in the U.S. of A. And you can see the trailer over at thenextreel.com on this week's uh, movie post. I'm curious about the direction the story takes because the the uh, the story, the cat, which is based on uh, the full title, the cat, a tale of feminine redemption, mm-hmm. is written by Marie Louise von Franz, as you said, and she was a Swiss Jungian psychologist and scholar. So it makes me wonder if the the film itself takes a very uh, psychological twist as well, or if it's, if the screenplay adaptation of it, which is based on, I guess, another screenplay, it's a little. It seems like it's its own little <laughs> folding screenplay. thing going on here. But it's based, based on, on the, the screenplay cat, the one that mo- was in a box. <laughs> well, it's based on the original screenplay Motel by James Russo, who based it off of that original s- story. And James Russo is not credited for this one, but they based this, their script off of his script, which doesn't look like it ever was made into a movie. Oh, well, that's a much bigger mess than I did. So did. David it, Grovek and Paul Conway actually wrote that. Yeah, it's, it seems like a convoluted mess. Like, how yeah, did that right. happen? Uh, and yet, it is, uh, you know, it is a bag, likely with a cat in it, that may be <laughs> alive and or dead at the same time. That's wow. what we're saying. It's a philosophy film. It is. So I'm going to see it. February 28th. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> what about you? Excellent. My trailer this week is a, uh, a, a new vampire movie this looks coming so weird. out soon. That uh, it, it looks, it does look weird. It is not the standard vampire movie that you expect to see. No, it is Jim Jarmusch doing a vampire movie. And if you know anything about Jim Jarmusch and his films, they definitely aren't of the norm. So this is two vampires who have been loved, in love for centuries, played uh, by Tilda Swinton and Tom Hiddleston. It looks uh, like an interesting cast. It also has Mia Wasikowska, John Hurt, Anton Yelchin, Jeffrey Wright, and... You know, I don't even fully know what to say about it other than it doesn't look like a vampire film, like a typical blood-sucking vampire film. This looks kind of like 
romantic drama set in the world of vampires who have been around for way too long. <laughs> they just, they kind of like have these emotional problems that they still deal with after hundreds of years. You know, Tom Hiddleston is a, you know, plays guitar and is just like this, seems like kind of, he's going to be that emotional mess of a musician. And even though he's centuries old, he still can't quite figure out how to deal with things. And I don't know. It, it, it piques my curiosity. I, I always have a hard time with Jim Jarmusch's films. And I know some people love him. There are, a, I haven't seen a lot of them. I've only seen a few of them and I haven't, I don't think I've really liked that many of them. So I'm curious to see this and curious to see if it's something that I end up liking or if it's something that I end up watching and scratching my head at and then going, mm, okay, well I can at least check it off my list. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> No, I, you know, there are, there are some of his, uh, I, I'm looking at his list of films and I, you know, you're right. Some of them are just kind of out there, but this one has John Hurt in it. Yeah. A lot of movies have John Hurt. And I know. And I, I, ten, but see, I tend to like the John Hurt. If, it, if there's a movie with John Hurt in it, I tend to have some unaffinity for it. Okay. I don't know. Am I totally wrong on that? Give me one that John Hurt was in that was just plum terrible, that he was not at least some, in some way entertaining. Well, I'd say Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, but I mean, I guess to an extent he was entertaining, but That's still. That's what I'm saying. You can't say he wasn't, at least in some way, entertaining. Yeah, I still don't. Well, Hellboy? I, entertaining. I, yeah. Elephant Man? Entertaining. V for Vendetta? Entertaining. Yeah. Huh? I, See? I don't know. I, I'm sure there's something. If I had time to go through his entire filmography of all 188 credits that he has, mm -hmm. I'd let you know. But I, I'm sure there's something buried in there somewhere. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. All 65 episodes of Merlin, the BBC TV series, as the dragon. Entertaining. <laughs> you could just say the man, the myth, the legend, John Hurt. I'm saying. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. All right, we'll go with that. All right. See yeah. it for John Hurt, See if it for, for no other reason. <laughs> <laughs> he will preemptively redeem this Jim Jarmusch fam family. There, film. there you go. There you That's go. what I'm saying. This is coming out April 11th, so I, I'm guessing it's going to be an art house film and not a wide release. Yeah. That's good. Does it make you sad just a little bit? Not really. I mean, it's Jim Jarmusch. I don't expect to see him just down the street from me. <laughs> I expect to really have to work to go appreciate Jim Jarmusch. I actually do expect to see him like down the street from me. <laughs> do you really? That's the. <laughs> Was he frozen I there too? To... I just expect to see him just standing on the corner sometime, <laughs> wondering. And you've been disappointed all this time, but you're still expecting one of these days. <laughs> there, there you he's are. Gonna be. Finally, he's, he's hanging out on in Northwest Portland. <laughs> And now, uh, I think we need to go one level deeper. What's the most resilient parasite? An idea. A single idea from the human mind can build cities. An idea can transform the world and rewrite all the rules. Which is why I have to steal it. Never recreate from your memory. Always imagine new places. He's hiding something, and we need to find out what that is. We gotta break out of here. Give him the kick! This was not a part of the plan! Wake me up! We're talking about dreamscape, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you remember that movie? Do I? What? I, I loved that movie when it came out. That was the best. It was Dennis all... Quaid and Max yeah. von Sydow. Are you kidding? And Christopher Plummer. I forgot Christopher Plummer was in that. And that giant lizard thing that came down yeah, that, that chased him down the stairs. Like that snake. He who is, is it? Was is a it snake Christopher Plummer who turns into the giant snake monster thing? <laughs> no, I no. Wasn't that uh, Tommy? Wasn't that Tommy? David Patrick Kelly. Yeah, 
that's him. Yeah, that looks like somebody. Who yeah, it was, it was David Patrick Kelly, and he was the other guy who could jump into people's dreams. And uh, he was the bad dreamer. Where yeah. Den Dennis Quaid was the young and uh, the, the sprightly good dreamer. Mm hmm Oh, that was a great movie. <laughs> in my mind. <laughs> yes, in my mind. Rewatching it may not be that great, but uh, yes. Oh, but, uh, man. You know, I was thinking about that watching Inception this time. Why is everything in these dreams just so normal? Why don't people have like giant snake creatures <laughs> coming right? out in their dreams? No, I'm sure James Bond dreams, those are fun and all that. But where's the snake creatures? Yeah. Well, you know, we're, I... We're standing naked in front of your, your high school class. <laughs> where, is, where, is, where is the giant uh, head of, animatronic head of Freddy Krueger? Eating Patricia Arquette. That's right. Right? That's what I'm saying. He's a dream warrior. <laughs> <laughs> that was another one. Nightmare on Elm Street 3, 1987. Let's see. Ah. Uh, that's uh, okay. So you've now covered why I already liked Inception before I saw it. Because it's a dream movie and I like dream movies. Absolutely. Right? Like you're you're already you were sucked in by just the trailer. Yeah, just just anything dealing with dreams I, I do love. Particularly lucid dreaming movies, like where the dreamer has control of the dream. Yeah, absolutely. Right? That's the only way you can overpower Freddy Krueger. Yeah. I was all into lucid dreaming when I was young. Totally. Lucid dreaming, that's I was totally into uh, Vanilla Sky, Eternal Sunshine, even, that says that sort of dream thing. You, you had to bring Vanilla Sky into this conversation? I did. I did that. You sure did. Punk? What <laughs> dreams may come? Mm, bring it. <laughs> there you go. I liked that one. Uh -huh. That, that, that was, was good. Pretty, that was pretty. The Matrix, please. That's not a dream movie. Sort of. Altered not state, really. altered consciousness. You can control your world. Same vibe. Yeah. Don't, don't. Don't. Okay. okay. Oh, uh, sure. Uh, yeah. The Matrix. All right. No, I, I agree. No, I don't know if you can be trusted. <laughs> so all that is to say that I was already into Inception before I even saw it. And uh, then I saw it. You know what? I still the like world, it. I, I okay, like it. I was going to say the world came crashing down. No, no, no. <laughs> I, I uh, like it quite a lot. Yeah. It, it lived up uh, almost to all of my expectations. How was, yeah, that for, was, how was that for a teaser? That was great. That was a good <laughs> teaser. Go ahead. Tell me what you think no, about this film. I, I think it's a fantastic film. I, 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 it, this was a film that I think um, it was a very risky film to, to go ahead and make. I mean, the studio thought so. The studio was very nervous about making a film like this that was, I mean, I think we've talked about this on the show before, where yeah. It's an original script. It has, uh, it's not a prequel. It's not a sequel. It's not based on anything uh, other sort of material. It's just an original script that has, it costs a huge amount of money to make. And it's by, yes, it's by a big director. But even with all of that, the studio is nervous going into it, uh, you know, doling out the $160 million it costs to make the film. And, uh, I mean, I certainly would be nervous giving anyone that much money to go spend on, uh, you know, play things. But Christopher Nolan, I think, was able to prove them wrong, or at least prove them right in their belief that, yes, he was uh, worth giving this money to, because he told an incredibly original story that holds up every time you watch it, and uh, takes you places that I don't think uh, a lot of people expected to go. And I really enjoyed the journey of this. I enjoy the emotional uh, catharsis of exploring this story with Dom Cobb, played by Leonardo DiCaprio. I enjoy the uh, the heist mystery thriller. I don't even. It's not really a heist. It, you know, it's Inception. It's the reverse of a heist. Um, I enjoy that whole concept of this uh, this pursuit to actually plant this idea in somebody's head. And uh, I, I think all of that blended together in an incredible way to tell just really, I mean, it's a riveting story. And 
I get wrapped up into it every time I watch it, and I'm excited to see it every time that uh, that I put it on. Me too. I I actually I I deeply uh, love this movie. I'm I'm very attached to it, and it's that's why I, it's a little bit fragile to talk about it because it's another one of those movies that I feel like I can overthink pretty easily, um, and and I don't want to make the same mistake I did last week when we talked about the abyss, uh, because I got in trouble by you, and I don't want to get in trouble <laughs> again. Because now you hate it. <laughs> I still like it. I still like it a lot. Uh, no, but the uh, the uh, the thing about this movie, the the risk I think goes uh, even deeper than that. The risk in making this movie in this era of filmmaking uh, and making the choices that he made about the production itself, I think, is is uh, it, it carries some risk to it. I mean, you know, now uh, there would be a uh, this film would be uh, a wash in. Uh, CGI to do what they did on this film and he made uh, the choice to go old school and I am amazed at how great this film looks uh, using uh, just practical in-camera effects. I mean, what they, w- the the just genuine sort of cleverness, the old school cleverness that they brought to this film and made it look a- it, on a scale that, that I think is, um, um, you know, not achieved regularly anymore. I'm, I, it just excites me to watch this. And, and uh, you know, this is one of those where I, I put on all of the, um, the behind-the-scenes stuff, um, uh, the making of, and I watched it with my daughter, the making of stuff. She hasn't seen the film, you know, she's 11, right? Mm-hmm. But we watched all the making of stuff, uh, in particular the flood scene in the beginning, right? We, we watched how they tear apart the Japanese castle. Right. And uh, what's so beautiful about that, first of all, was, you know, that just stunned her that they achieve the shaking of the room by just shaking the camera. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and she's, I mean, she had that sense of awe and wonder that they just shake the camera. How does that work? That's amazing. And then, <laughs> uh, and then just dropping rocks and, and wood and stuff on these actors. I said, well, they're just like made of styrofoam. So she says, what? And they just drop all that stuff on those actors? Just a sense of wonder. And then, uh, you know, we, I turned on the sequence from the actual film, and she was just drop-jawed, stunned. Hmm. At how cool it looked when those can- those air cannons shoot the water in that that sort of sequence all, right. uh, on Leo, she was stunned. And that after I had just watched the movie just a few hours prior to watch it again and watch her face, you know, uh, capturing that moment, uh, just reminded me what a feat this this movie is. Uh, it's this is a, it's it's a modern classic. Yeah, it absolutely is. I think Christopher Nolan. Uh, I mean, he's done a lot of just really great modern classics. I would say. Yeah. Um, I mean, if you, I, I guess at least in Dark context, Dark Knight Rises, of, I think, is one of your favorites. In, con- <laughs> in context of his body of work, I mean, a lot is yeah. you know, I mean, Memento, and this, and I think the first two Batman films. And, you know, I mean, he's he's done, I think, the following and um, what's the one he did with Robin Williams and Al Pacino, the remake? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The uh, the f- photo one. Uh, no, not the photo one. Yeah. Anyway, uh, as as in context insomnia, of insomnia. insomnia, in context of a remake, I think he did it. He took that the original story and he, he did something. I I found enjoyable with it, even if I don't think it it worked all the way through. But I still really enjoyed it. I think he and, and then the Prestige, which we've also talked yes. about here. I mean, yes. he's he's a very smart filmmaker, and I think it always comes through in his work, even if the film itself isn't as great as it could be. I just think he's just a smart smart filmmaker. I, I absolutely. Um, and it, it was. It's interesting. This film. The stakes that it sets, right? Uh, and uh, you know, I'm I'm sure we'll talk about the ending. I I'm very interested to know kind of what your sense is of how the film resolves. Um, it's one of those films that you know it it seems so much like the objective of the film um, is to create. And I don't want to overuse the word fragile, but this fragile state of of being able to consider the film long after you've seen it, uh, and yet still create a massive, um, you know, engrossing cinema feature. Right? The, this it, it it has very much sort of antique sensibilities about it. 
and and that's one of the things that I like the I, I like so much about it. The, the dramatic structure of it I, is where I. Uh, it's not even so much the dramatic structure. I like the way it is structured. Right. It it really is. I mean, insofar as it's sort of an inverse heist technically it it's it's a genre film in that it, it is a heist film i mean we have mm-hmm. this gang and each of them has a role uh, and a function and it is all uh, targeted around a mark and what what they do uh, you know and, and typically they would be stealing something here they're trying to plant something in uh, in the mark's mind um, but what's unique about this in particular is that the mark is with them for much of the film, you know, and that, yeah, that right. the end is actually, you know, their goal is actually sitting next to them for, for much of the end of the film. Um, but one of the things that I think is hard about this film, and I, I'm interested in your take on this in particular, is the setup. Because this is an original property, and this film makes me think about this in Hollywood in general more than many others. Because it's an original property, uh, and we have no sense of, you know, uh, you know, we know where Superman came from. We can kind of move quickly through how he gets his suit. We know how the Avengers came together. We can kind of move through quickly some of those things. We have no idea what the rules of this universe are. And my sense is, watching the film this time, there is an awful lot of uh, dialogue, of description uh, in the opening act of this film in order to set up the rules of the space. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, the whole, uh, I mean, really, the whole first hour of the film is leading up to them getting on the plane with the mark and setting up this whole heist or, you know, inception of, right. of this idea that they're trying to do. And it's it's very interesting to me that it really does take a full hour of exposition trying to give us a sense as to how this world works. And even after that hour mark, we're still getting hit up with more exposition and more exposition through the entire film all the way up really until the third act when when it, we start coming out of it and and everything. Now we're just really focused on, you know, Cobb and his, uh, you know, hopeful escape out of limbo and eventual redemption with his family and everything that's uh, it it is an amazing amount of exposition that they have to get across in this film and it's you know it speaks to something that i talk to about uh with my students quite a bit is the whole idea of how do you get exposition across in ways that it's not just basically you know putting the brakes on the story and allowing the actors to just you know, spout information at you, hoping that you're going to grasp all of it. And then the story kind of picks up and starts moving forward again. How can you avoid stopping it dead? And, you know, we talk about this term exposition or this, you know, idea of exposition as a bullet quite a bit where you really need to throw it at them in ways where it's involved in a scene and uh, that something is happening and somebody's trying to explain real quickly something as it's happening so that people can kind of gr- the the characters in the story can grasp their heads around it and that's i think why they smartly have uh the architect the first architect basically get uh, you know, taken at the beginning of the film and they get a new architect. I mean, that's the, really, it's smart screenwriting. The only way they can really explain the story to the audience is, is by bringing in a new team member who needs all of this stuff explained to her. This is Ariadne as, uh, as she is getting, uh, you know, indoctrinated to this, this world of, dreams and breaking into people's dreams and uh, i think they mostly do it really smartly throughout the film i think there are a few times where the exposition does slow down a bit and it feels a little bit like it's just exposition without moving the story forward quite so much but i think for the most part they do a pretty solid job with it yeah for the most part i you know i think the the pieces that that are the most awkward there are sequences where we have um you know joseph gordon levitt uh stepping in between ariadne's training and you know uh cobb's psychological issues Mm-hmm. And and he's intercepting and describing something that everybody knows, and you know that he's describing it because of for us, right? Mm-hmm. It, it's when that wall is broken, right? You, you where it becomes obvious that this is this is exposition strictly for the case of the audience, for the sake of the audience, and not for the sake of anybody else on screen. 
They they should. Right. Everybody else should al- already be up to speed here. And that's the part that I, I feel like is is risky and hard. Uh, and you know, I'm, obviously, I don't have a solution. The movie's been made, but it just feels like there are some there are some points of weakness in that first act in particular. Now, in the second and third act, we uh, you know, I think I know the sequences you're talking about. And when whenever Cobb is alone with Ariadne, uh, you know, walking through the old house, describing the relationship and sort of uncovering, kind of unpeeling the onion of his relationship with his, um, you know, with his wife, uh, that really works for me. You know, I'm into that story. I'm into that drama, the the dramatic retelling. Uh, and I think they balance it really well with the flashbacks. Um, well, and even earlier, I mean, when he first introduces her to the world and, and she's her first experience of being an architect and the way that she's changing everything and the whole cafe and everything exploding yeah. in the, that Parisian cafe and then kind of the folding of the city. So there's a lot of exposition going on in that sequence. But it's but done it, so visually. It's done so visually. It's It's done in such a way where... It's it's a thrill to be involved in that exposition because we get to see somebody who's absorbing that exposition and translating it into these amazing actions on screen of folding a city in half and the whole thing she does with the mirror doors creating the the kind of the infinite view down all those mirrors and just and, and following then building to the point where the subconscious kind of comes and attacks her and kills her. I mean it's 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 a great riveting introduction to that world and there's a lot of exposition there i I think for the most part he does handle it really well but you're right there are some parts and there's really no way around it at all the the strength of it really falls on the actor's shoulders of being able to get it across in a way where it's not going to feel uh like it the movie's coming to a complete halt and i think you know to the for the most part leonardo dicaprio and joseph gordon levitt in those scenes and even ellen page anytime any of the people are involved in the exposition they do handle it pretty well for the most part yeah i think they do too i you know i'm i'm thinking in particular you mentioned the the training scene right which i which i love i mean that's a fantastic sequence and i think uh, you know ellen page is great she looks so just it, like you say that sort of wide-eyed enthusiasm for for total godlike control over her universe um the sequence leading up to that between leo and michael kane uh was absolutely useless right it was ex- exposition for us like there mm-hmm. there was nothing that we don't get later through action uh that we get through that sequence in in general for to me that was a sequence that served two purposes one look i have michael kane in my film again and two um pretty much look i have michael kane in my film again <laughs> Yeah, and I, I can't remember. Was there much about his kids in that particular scene, or was it mostly just about finding a new architect? Yeah, finding a new architect, and you know, don't be evil. <laughs> so, I but you know, that was the um, that, that's that's just the, you know the competing um, influences of of how sequences don't get cut. This is not a not a terribly short movie. It feels like it moves along at a pretty good clip, but that's you know there are sequences like that that just feel a little bit heavy. Um, it doesn't, you know, that's, that's nitpicking because most of this film's, uh, you know, rides on trying to unravel the logic and the visuals. Right. And on both of those fronts, I think it succeeds very well. Yeah, it absolutely does. Uh, where do you want to go next? You want to talk more about the visuals and production or you want to talk more about the, the, uh, the dreamy stuff? Um, let's talk more about the visuals and production first. I I think that uh, the idea of dream time was something that was uh, really uh, captured in a in a nice way. I like how as you go into a dream, the time in that dream state, you can you have much more time in that dream state than you do in the real world. Like a like I can't remember how long they had in that cafe scene in the whole French sequence, but she said it felt like an hour. It was five. But it was only like five, five minutes, minutes. Yeah. right? And then as you go to the next layer, it's like then that's a week, and then the next layer it's a month, and then you know then it just keeps getting progressively longer as you go deeper and deeper into different dreams. And I love the way that they do that, playing with uh, slow motion, particularly the way that the entire build and the climax plays out where you've got the incredible slow motion 
of the van falling off the bridge that you kind of keep cutting back to periodically to remind the audience where we are with all these different layers of dreams in which we are. And then uh, you've got that, and then you've got Joseph Gordon-Levitt um, in the elevator. And uh, interestingly, they don't really play that in slow motion. And I think possibly it's because it would have been a little too confusing having two sequences in slow motion, like different slow motion scenes, while one of them is also anti-gravity and everybody's right. floating around. It might have been a little too much to go, what is, what is going on here? Well, wait a minute, because they already had two anti-gravity, because they kept cutting from that one back to the truck falling backwards. Well, the truck is falling backwards, which creates the anti-gravity in yes. Joseph Gordon-Levitt's hotel, where he is strapping everybody into right. the elevator. Yes. Yeah, as okay. he's floated, pushing them around floating. That's, yeah, the, one, that, that's the hotel. That's the one we're talking about. Yeah, because right. that would also technically be in slow motion when we're looking at it from the... Perspective the, uh, of the third The dream. James Bond mountain scene yes. at the end of, of at that <laughs> particular sequence. But I guess for, the, for that one, we're, or for the elevator hotel, we're particularly looking at it from Joseph Gordon-Levitt's perspective, which is why I would guess that we don't see that in slow motion either. Well, it's why I kept expecting the James Bond mountain scene to be moving a little bit faster. (laughs) Like a silent film? (laughs) Yes. But, you know, I, you know, I'm glad you brought up that, that topic, and I, I, I don't want to interrupt too much, but I, I do want to mention how brilliantly that concept uh, is introduced to the film and how delicately it's introduced to the film, right? In the very opening sequence, right. um, the, you know, when uh, uh, Leo is still under and Joseph Gordon-Levitt comes out and tells the architect, give him the kick. Uh, and we see Leo sitting up tied to a chair over, uh, you know, with a bathtub of, we assume, cold water behind him. And the kick, in this case, is being pushed over on the chair, so he falls. And right as he begins to fall, that's when the slow motion kicks in, and that's when you, you know, we cut back to the Japanese castle and see it's it's falling apart, and then the waves come in as soon as he hits the water. That's our first introduction of the, the relationship of film speed to time uh, in the dream world. And we don't recognize that. I didn't recognize it that I'd already seen that concept until the second time I saw the film uh, and and just really felt it it felt just right at home. It was such a great indoctrination to how they play with time. Yeah, it is great, especially as you come back to that time and you see the that slow motion um leonardo kind of like bursting out of the water and then kind of coming back to full time it's almost like that moment where you go from that dream time to that waking up you know reality time as you're kind of jarred back to reality it's just it, it was really smart filmmaking i love the way that he used the ramping effect of 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 time speeding up and slowing down in order to really help create that in the audience's mind um uh, yes, I absolutely love that. I the the other you know you've already mentioned the Joseph Gordon Levitt um, a bit, and and for me in terms of just raw action in this film, uh, the fight sequence on the uh, the rotating gimbal in the hotel, right? Yeah. I mean that was you know for my money one of the most exciting sequences. Um, you know, it's one of the most exciting, memorable sequences in modern film for me. Like, I just, I, I love it so, so much. Uh, and that he did, you know, there's no stuntman for him. He's all, he, he did all the, the, the wire and running on walls work himself. And it was, it's just brilliantly executed. Um, yeah, and and the fact that you know I, I, he took uh, Christopher Nolan took inspiration from two thousand one, and the way they had the rotating sets in that film to create the reality of what life would be like on a spaceship, and incorporated that into this film into these corridors as they are losing sense of gravity, or at least which is the right gravity as first the van rolls. And then later as the van kind of uh, plummets off of the bridge and, you know, that first one where it rolls and, and all of a sudden the, as he's chasing and fighting and he's basically he and the the uh, the the people that he's atta- or attacking him that he's trying to uh, kill. They're all kind of running on the walls and the ceiling and jumping around through the doors into the rooms and all over the place. It's, it is truly, like you said, one of the most exhil- exhilarating action sequences to come out of cinema in uh Probably this in the 2000s. I, I can't think of anything else in the 2000s that that quite 
is as as unique and exhilarating. Yeah, you know, I mean, it, to me, it's it's up there with in terms of just let's just say fist fights, right? The the uh, the first um, Daniel Craig Bond movie, right? The way that film opens, mm-hmm. the bathroom fight scene, that was one that had me like practically standing up in the theater. It was it yeah, was such a it, gritty, uncomfortable. This one, like, it takes it to that next level of ethereal right. awesome. You know, yeah, for me, right. It's like if if that Jen, Daniel Craig one could have been on the walls and the it, ceilings. That, that's and... what that is. What would have made it perfect? That would yep. have made it perfect. So I, I I deeply like this, and this is already a movie with so many deeply visual and wonderful things. I think they they really captured for me uh, the this the the dreamscape. Uh, context: the idea that they have they're stuck in traffic on a rainy day, and suddenly a freight train comes down the, down the barreling down the street was wonderful and a great surprise the first time I saw it. It's a great surprise every time because the sound when that train hits their car is so loud. Yeah, I I mean it takes me by surprise every time, even though I know it's coming. I think it's just the way they mixed the sound. It's it's a, a really perfect sound mix across the board in this film uh with the the highs and the lows man when that uh, i mean they are already it is kind of already kind of an intense street chase scene that is going on but as they're kind of coming up on that thing and then the train comes barreling by and down the middle of the street i mean it's just so loud and intense and and it just ramps again ramps that action sequence which is just kind of a standard shoot up in the streets to that next level did you? Uh, th- that's right. I, you know, I, I think we should. Who? Uh, let's see. I don't have it open. Who did the sound mixing on this one? It was. Let me see who it was. Sound. Do you re- mix. While you're looking that up, do you remember uh, Twister, 1996? Helen I Hunt, do. You know, Bill Paxton. Oh yeah. You yes, that? I do. That was uh, Jan de Bont, right? Uh, that yes, was not, it was. It was not a great film, uh, but it had one of that's... the best sound mixes in cinema of the 90s. I don't know if you remember that, but this was the first movie that I ever went to with Twister that actually had a warning outside that said, this sound is going to break your face. <laughs> it, and Yes, I remember that. It was very much, you know, it, it was almost like uh, allowing the theaters to turn it up a little more. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's really kind of what they <laughs> that's said. That's what that was. But, yeah. but to me, I mean, that's what I think about those tornadoes barreling down on, on uh, you know, poor Bill. And uh, Carrie Elwes, uh, <laughs> and I think about that, the, just the blowing wind in this movie when uh, when that train comes down, it's that same level of jarring, uh, nightmarish, uh, you know, shock that that hits with that train. It was beautiful, and the train was a was a semi, yeah, uh, tractor trailer that they had modified and put a bunch of plywood on and shot it down the street. Brilliant. Yeah. It was cool. It was cool. By the way, it was Richard King who did the sound editing on this, and it was Laura Hershberg, Gary Rizzo, and Ed Novick who did the uh, they did the sound mixing. So all of them won Academy Awards for their spectacular sound work on this film. As they should. Yes. Brilliant. 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 Uh, let's see. What else do we have to? to what's the next uh, big sequence that you want to talk about? The I just I mean I think there's just so many things that that show how Christopher Nolan wanted to take this film up to the next level and and try to not do it um, with CG as much as possible. Things like the fact that the bar when they're in the bar sequence and the van is kind of going the bar of the hotel and the van is kind of in the one level up kind of racing through the streets and all of a sudden like all of the drinks start tilting and everything looks kind of a little askew and this is when uh leonardo DiCaprio is playing that you know mr charles or whatever it is um kind of like i'm your dream security i'm here to help you sort of guy and look around at how everything how everything is so weird and you see all these drinks tilting and just everything is kind of the lights are tilting everything's kind of sideways a little bit that was an actual bar that they built on a stage that would raise up like you know, 25 degrees or something like that to create that effect instead of just doing it all in cg and it just it boggles my mind when i look at it because i'm like why i why would they go to such a length to create that little effect? I mean, yes, it does create this unsettled look across a number of things in the scene, but to me, it just it's it stands out as as really pushing to create something that 
it, it's not missing those things that a digital person coming in later may miss. Oh, but the way that that, that cup kind of swung a little bit, you know, it's just those, those subtle things that end up happening that when it's really tilting that you don't get necessarily when it's done digitally that I really like. I mean, they, they, they actually had to even audition all the extras for that bar scene because they had, because a lot of extras could not act normally when they were tilted and they were getting sick and all this stuff. So they actually had to bring people in and audition them so that they could sit at tables or walk, whatever, when it was all tilted and look completely normal. I, I think it's taking it to that next level that really stands out. I think so, too. Uh, to me, the, um, the, the sequence of um, the Penrose stairs. Yeah. Uh, the uh, impossible stairs uh, that um, uh, this was uh, Escher yeah. did the impossible stairs, the stairs that look like they're going both up and down at the same time, and they, they run into each other. And, and it, you know, this, this is very easy to do in modeling. It's, it's one of those things that computers are, are easy to do. It is harder to do uh, in film. And this is one of those things that they nailed to mathematical perfection. And this is, uh, you know, I, I, I guess credit goes to that this sort of combination of, let's see, who's production design? Guy Diaz and uh, um, Wally Pfister and, um, you know, and Christopher Nolan and the team that build this rack of fake, of impossible stairs and shot it in a way that looked just perfect so that when the reveal hits, you think this is, the, I, I can't believe they did that. That is fantastic. Yeah. And it was so complex, they said, that they they could not figure out how to do it without having do it going through a whole computer model of the entire shot, setting up how they would build the set, where the camera would be positioned, how they would have to move it in order to make everything, uh, the reveal make sense and everything. They said it was, it was so much more complex than they even initially thought. And uh, But the fact that they really did it, not just once, but twice in the film, yeah. I mean, it really, it really uh, it does amaze me. It is. It is fantastic. And when you see, I love the behind the scenes when they actually show, you know, how the 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 precision with which they had to approach it, and and that the only CG in the sequence is actually to remove the rig that holds the stairs in the air, right. not in any way to affect the stairs themselves, as they did yeah. all that practically. I think that's amazing. Yeah, it is amazing. It's really wonderful. Something else that. I didn't realize until I was uh, doing more research on the film this time was that in the mountain sequence later in the film, the big yes. James, James Bond villain, you know, mountain fortress uh, sequence, the fact that they actually created real avalanches to come tumbling down that mountain. I, I was convinced <laughs> that the, every time I've watched this, I was convinced that they're all CG avalanches. But no, they actually flew around and they had avalanche experts throwing, I don't know what they threw, I guess dynamite and things like that, out of the plane to to hit in certain areas that would actually create these avalanches that they would then fly around and film so they could use them in context of the film. You know, I that they even went so far as to build that giant fortress in the first place. Right. <laughs> says enough. I mean, that was the fort. They built a fortress uh, in Canada. But that's what you get when you shoot in Canada. You get to set off your own avalanches. That's right. It's funny because they, they built this. They found the, a great place that had been used in other films like The Borden Legacy, some of that film there, Van Helsing, Brokeback Mountain, RV, The Claim. Um uh, this this ski resort, which is just these stunning mountains, and I guess it had been closed for a while, though it's open now. I think it's one of those private, I don't know if it's a private ski resort, but you have to pay lots and lots of money to go there because you have to go in on like a cat to to take you up into the mountain and then you can ski down it. So that, that's the only way you can actually get up there. And of course, the mountain is now called Fortress Mountain, which <laughs> right. I think is... Yeah, I'm assuming it was named after this film. So, but yeah, they they there was no snow leading up to this film, and everyone was getting incredibly nervous that there was no snow on the mountain. Here they built this fantastic fortress up there. Luckily, a few days I guess before they uh, filmed, or maybe it was a week or so, uh, just a ton of snow dumped and actually made it work perfectly. But yeah, I mean it's it is an amazing scene and the fact that they you know blow it up and the i mean they did end up having to create a model for some of those but just everything is just 
so present when you watch this. You know, and, and to your point earlier about just the, the level of sort of attention to detail that Christopher Nolan has in this film, uh, you know, Emma Thomas said of, of Fortress Mountain, she said, you know, the reason we went there is because Chris wanted uh, the, the incredibly detailed and authentic view behind the fortress. Like we knew we could create the fortress anywhere, but we didn't have the mountains. And the first thing I'm thinking there is, you know, we used to do that with paintings. Yeah. Like he did an awful lot to get, uh, to get these shots, to have the mountains behind him that, uh, that could otherwise be created in so many other ways. And, uh, it just, it, you can, it just really, you can really tell. Plus you can't, you know, make paintings avalanche. It's hard. It's it harder hard. to do. It's harder to do. Yeah. But um, uh, yeah, I, I, it's it, all of that. The, I mean, everything that we've talked about. You know, the the train, the paradoxical architecture, the even the explosions of the cafe, the opening uh, castle, this fortress. All of it, I think, it just stands as a testament to what Christopher Nolan was going for in this film and creating these amazing. Uh, dream worlds that we get to enjoy over the course of the film, but also just, you know, creating a world where we can just sit in it and just relax and not worry about trying to find where's the green screen and all that. We can just enjoy the realities of it, which is funny yeah. coming from a dream movie. Yes. <laughs> you know, normally in a dream movie, you'd think it's it's going to be full of special effects or I mean, like creative uh, uses of, of computer effects in it, you know, yeah, yeah. flying unicorns. And <laughs> so um, the film, uh, you know, it's, you know, dream within a dream within a dream within a dream. And the the film ends on his uh, his totem, you know, his little top spinning. Mm-hmm. Um and how do you how do you feel when this film ends because the 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 the, the setup is you know we, we if the top falls over we're led to believe that he, it is not a dream if the top just keeps on spinning then it's likely he's in a dream and he's lost touch with reality uh, right right and so at the end he he's you know he's he comes out of what we are led to believe is his last dream, and he he is, you know, everything works out well for him, and he goes home, and he's at the table, and the, he spins the top, and then his kids interrupt him, and and suddenly he's, you know, he walks outside, and the film ends. The top never falls over. It's still spinning when it ends. And as, if you look at each time that the top has had been spun, right, the, the first... I think it's spun three times. One time it falls over. The other two times we never... It, I think it spins... For 18 to 20 to 26 seconds and the last one spins like 40 seconds and still spinning when it ends how do you feel when he walks out and it cuts to credits i uh every time it cuts to credits i have a huge smile on my face because i think it's just a genius ending because i to me the point of the film has always been for for Cobb to get back to his children. And last we saw he had been lost in limbo and then he does come out and and ends to and you know he he's welcomed back into the US. He gets to go back and he gets to see his children. Whether the top falls or not, I don't think was ever the point of the ending. I think the point of the ending is that Cobb makes it back to his children and if the if the top falls, we know it's real and he's with his children. If the top doesn't fall, we know he's with his children, but it's a dream world with his children. And the fact that Christopher Nolan chooses to end it where we don't see whether it falls or not, it's telling us, at least it's telling me, that it, it doesn't matter if, if he's in the real world or if this is now a dream state that he's created in limbo. Because if he was caught in limbo, at least he's now created a world for himself where he, where er, he made it so everything worked out and he was able to get back and finally be with his children. In his mind, he's in the place he needs to be, and that is with his kids. Personally, I think that the top will fall after it cuts and maybe that's me because I'm a parent and I want to know that I would be able to get back to my kids in the real world and not just have to get back to them in a dream state but 
yeah, I mean, I really like the ending. I think it's a smart, smart ending, and uh, I, that's my interpretation. Hmm. I really like that interpretation, although, and and I hadn't ever looked at it that way, and that's uh, you know part of the gift of the movie. I uh, I don't know. Um, you know, the, I think you can make a case either way. There are there are hints either way throughout the film, and that's one of the things that makes it brilliant. I, you know, at the very surface, when you look at the kids, each time we see the kids, they're wearing the same clothes until the end. When you look at it side by side, early shot of the kids doing their thing, late sh- the last shot of the kids, the kids are wearing different clothes. For the first time, they're wearing different clothes. And to me, that is uh, that is a clue that maybe he's in in the real world. And as you say, the camera cuts, and it's gonna. It, it's going to cut to um, the the top's going to fall over. On the other hand, um, there's part of me that is a little bit completist in Christopher Nolan's films not ending happily. He just mm-hmm. doesn't have a real history of ending films necessarily. I mean, Memento does not end particularly <laughs> happily. <laughs> uh, you know, they're they're all dark, right? They're they're just dark. They tend to veer dark, and to me, I I just feel like this fits more in the set in the in the canon, and I think there are more elements that lead you to believe he may be, um, he may be still in a dream. Let alone the fact that the top, which is sort of an unreliable token, um, the, because it wasn't his. I think that's one of the the sort of right. failing points of the token as a as a marker, um, that uh, he. He ends stuck in this place, uh, but now the when, to hear you describe it, uh, that being stuck in this place may not be all that bad. Yeah. So he wins whether or not he's lost. Right. Wow, that's really nice. And then there's a whole philosophy, which I, I don't uh, partake in, but when he's in Mombasa and he... Uh, he tries out the um, yeah. the sedative for the first time that uh, um, uh, what's his name gives him the uh, uh, Dilip Rao's character Yusuf. Yeah, when the when he's underneath the, when he's <laughs> under the building, they're all the people who come, and he says uh, these people came to wake up. That for them, the reality or the the dream the is dream their is reality. The reality. Right. When when Yusuf uh, puts him under with the sedative, and he has like kind of an intense dream about Mal. Um, when he wakes up, he runs to the bathroom and splashing water in his face. We still keep seeing flashes of Mal. We see her through the the gauzy curtain, sitting on the on the ledge across the hotel, of, of, you know, on the other hotel ledge. We see other flashes of her face, and then he pulls out his top and he tries to spin it uh, just before uh, he's interrupted. When um, uh, what's his name comes in. Um, uh, Ken Watanabe comes in and interrupts him and he knocks his uh, his top onto the floor and he never gets a chance to spin it. There's a whole philosophy that in that when he's put under with that sedative that he never actually wakes up from it. Right, and the right. rest of the film is a dream from that point forward. I don't really buy into that one. I, I think it's an interesting way to look at that. I think that he does come out of it, and it's just it was so intense that he just is uh, you know unable to actually get the top spun. But I'm sure if he did spin it, that it would have been fine. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm I agree with you because I, I I don't like the idea that the film technically ends so early. You right. Know, I mean, we right. get a lot of story afterward, but it's you know to know that it was all like that. Yeah, right. Manufactured. I, I, I struggle with that. Um, let's talk. Uh, let's uh, bust through the uh, cast, shall we? Yeah, it, it really is quite a stunning cast. I mean, Leonardo DiCaprio, uh, as we've said, Joseph Gordon Levitt, Ellen Page, Tom Hardy, Ken Watanabe as Saito, Dilip Rao, Killian Murphy, Tom Berenger, Marianne Cotillard, Pete Postlethwaite, Michael Caine, Lucas Haas. I mean, it's really a stunning cast that uh, right from top to bottom, I mean, they're just all fantastic and they do a lot of great stuff in here. I think the relationship between Cobb and Mal uh, portrayed in this film is really a heartbreaking relationship as, 
as malicious as Mal can be in some of the uh, dream sequences, I, I find that final moment between the two of them just powerful. And when it cuts to that shot of the two of them as as an old couple having grown old in the in limbo together, I mean, it just it's it really is a heartbreaking moment for me. And I, I think that the performers just bring so much out. I think so too, and and to the credit again of the of the just architecture of the relationships that that you know that Cobb has built, um, you know that we that Mal is is you know a part of him right that she's she's not there uh, that he is he is battling her as a piece of his uh, of his internal struggle to let go. I mean that that was that manifestation of him letting go uh you know even to the to the very last sequence where he he says so sweetly to her that you know i'm gonna let you go um it 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 is i I think that's a bit that earns the exposition up front right or in the second act when he's first introducing this the whole concept of this this lower level and his in that hotel room um it it's well-earned exposition when you hit that final moment and he lets go of her and and comes to sort of comes to terms with his demons his right. demon yeah. yeah and the fact that his demon was his wife is is made so much more sort of profound it's an interesting way to play that uh femme fatale character in a way where it is his wife and yeah. it's really and not i mean it kind of a shade of his wife as he says you know right. we never really get to meet his wife since no. she's long long dead right right it was interesting that uh you know she is in this film and she won her oscar for playing edith piaf when edith edith piaf's song plays such a prevalent role right. in this film i wonder if uh she uh ever sang a, a bit of this for Christopher. I, Christopher, I, why don't Christopher? you use this song? <laughs> use this song, Chris. Let me just... Let Here, me I'll just sing it for you. Rip this off for you. <laughs> uh, I, Tom Hardy, it's great to see him uh, from time to time, not in uh, a mask or, you know, shaved head beating on people. Yeah, yeah. I, I like he. Uh, I like him and uh, Cotillard so much more in this than in The Dark Knight Rises. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, uh, you yeah. know, I particularly like just the 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 humor of of uh, Gordon Levitt's and Hardy's uh, banter. I think is is wonderful. Um, and Killian yeah. Murphy, I like seeing him as uh, somebody who's helpless. And and he's so reserved in this film, and it always strikes me at first. I forget how kind of quiet and reserved he is as kind of that, just kind of that, uh, I don't know, that rich heir who just kind of steps away from the world because he doesn't want people to, you know, acknowledge him sort yeah. of thing. I, I find him really interesting in this film, and the way that he starts that way, and I, I really enjoy his catharsis as it builds to that last moment with his father. It's, uh, I think that was something really unique about the way that the whole heist worked, is how is this emotional um, build that they had to do for his character to move past his father's, uh, the relationship he had with his father, and to kind of create something in him that uh, um, that actually changed and accepted this inception. I I find that moment a really powerful moment in this film. I do too, um, and I find it it it, um, it you know it allows you to sort of mask one of the really subversive elements of the drama that it doesn't matter whether or not uh, you know he is to decide to break the company apart. You know. Um, None of that really matters. First, he's come to terms with the relationship with his father that has become to, has come to mean so much more than whatever he chooses to do when he wakes up. But two, uh, that uh, Leonardo comes to peace with his uh, relationship and is returned in whatever state with his kids, and that those two two uh, bits of healing, that's what the movie is about. Yeah. And and I, I it takes a little bit to for me to come to terms with that again because of my sort of natural um, need for completion. <laughs> uh, Hans Zimmer did the music. It's uh, really uh, you know Hans Zimmer is uh, sometimes he's great, sometimes he's not. But um, this is a time where he's just great, and I love the score. It's a powerful score. 
It's very bombastic. I think he said that he's assembled what he thinks is possibly the largest brass ensemble ever in a recording studio. He had six bass trombones, six tenor trombones, four tubas, and six French horns, all just blasting. He said that it was uh, the the physical force when all of them were blowing at once. I mean, you it would, it's like actually shake your teeth in this room. So, <laughs> I, I can I can only imagine how exhilarating some recording a score like uh, like this could be. The the way that he chose to use like he did a lot of it with uh, uh, synth, but then he also went in and and recorded the orchestra to kind of recreate some of these uh, synthesized sounds. So it had this kind of synth with real orchestra orchestra kind of playing synthesized sounds all layered together, plus some really great guitar work by uh, Johnny Marr from the Smiths. And it, I, all all told, it's just, it, it is really fitting score for this film. And even the way that he incorporated that, the Edith Piaf song, but at a really slow down level, how he, those, those big wong yeah. are actually kind of just the bass notes in the song, but they're spread out as if they're hearing them three layers deep in the dream. Oh, just wonderful. Yeah. I do like, I do like it. I think the, uh, the wongs are kind of an acquired taste, but I, I, uh, I feel like I've sort of acquired it. Yeah. It, it, because it fits so well in the film. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. We've already talked about Wally Pfister a bunch. Yeah, lots of times in lots of other movies. He's yes. a, he's a great cinematographer. I think he does a great job in this film. They did not shoot any IMAX in this film. Um, I know that's something that they've done for uh, the last two of the Batman films, but they did shoot uh, just anamorphic 35 with some of the stuff in 65 because they just wanted to make sure that they had big, gorgeous images to play with. Uh, nothing digital. I think Nolan, as far as I know, has still avoided shooting anything uh, digital. I don't know what he's going to do um, when film is completely dead, but I think he's still pushing for doing as much um, non- non-digital as possible. So we'll see. I, don't, I haven't heard anything about Interstellar. I was you? just going to say that. Uh, what, what's the story on uh, Interstellar? I don't know. I don't know if they're. I don't know how they're shooting that. I haven't. I haven't seen anything. But we'll have huh. to keep our. We'll have to keep our eyes open. Right. Uh, okay. Uh, who else is on your list? I already clicked away. Uh, I think that pretty much uh, hit everybody. I mean, it's uh, you know Lee Smith, great editing in this film. I mean, it's it's it does clip along at uh, you know about two and a half hours, just over two and a half hours long. It uh, it does feel like it moves very fast. And uh, I've never had a problem with the pacing. I think that the story just works really well. So I think it's a it's a solid team all across the board. Me too. Great fun. Uh, you know, it didn't do all that badly in the box office. Would you say? Yeah, no, it did okay. It did all right for itself. <laughs> this, uh, yeah, it it basically uh, it it shot way up there. I mean, it like I said, it cost 160 million dollars to make the prints and advertising budget looks to be about 75 million dollars um i you know i've heard some things about you know more money going into advertising for the rest of the world but i I haven't found any figures so right now i just have 235,000 as the or sorry 235 million as the total budget on the film um, which is a hefty chunk of change but when you look at a film uh, making Around the world, about eight hundred and thirty-two point five million dollars. It definitely did well for itself. On our list, it's number two uh, for the movie's cost per finished minute. It is a longer one. It's yeah. uh, you know one hundred and forty-eight minutes. So uh, unfortunately, that put it just behind Indiana Jones and Kingdom of the Crystal Skull <laughs> as far as profit per finished minute. But when you look at the adjusted for inflation, um, it still actually is behind Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, but it drops to number nine. It still is behind Jaws, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, Raiders of the Lost Ark, The Sting, Bush Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, Alien, and Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. That is stunning to me, right? I mean, doesn't that surprise that Crystal Skull is up there? Every week, I mean, we talk about this every week. I know. It and always... I'm surprised every week. It's like you've never said it before. What? <laughs> I, I'm surprised that there's not another Indiana Jones movie already, if they're all that successful. I think they're doing that, right? Isn't it? I hope not. Cemented? I locked? I don't know. Uh, 
All right. We should probably rank it. Let's do it. Let's I, rank this puppy. We're going to rank it. And, you know, if you want to know about this ranking thing, you should head, head over to flickchart.com uh, slash the next reel. And that is where you will find our stack rankings of our very favorite uh, films that we've talked about on this show. A hundred and some odd of them uh, we have talked about. And you can see how they rank against one another. And uh, we will see if Inception cracks the top 100. God, Let's I hope see. so. I know. Inception or The Barn Ultimatum? Inception. Yeah. Okay, I All think right. it's already cracked the top It's already 100. cracked the top 100, <laughs> yes. Inception or Moneyball? Inception. Inception, indeed. Inception, it always ends up with this one every single week. Inception well, the or All the President's Men. Men. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, my god! This is the first time in a long time that it's been really hard, that this is hard for me to think about. What do you I'm think? Gonna, I'm going to say Inception. Really? I love all the presidents, man. I, maybe it's just because it's sci-fi, and I am just uh, I can be a sucker for it, for it, uh, especially when it's good. And Inception is really good. It's really good. And you know what? There was a lot of exposition in all the presidents, men too. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. It I'm going to go get Inception. A free pass. All no. right. Whoa! You did it. I know. I did it. Inception or 500 Days of Summer. How 500 oh. Days of Summer is above all I know, presents. Right? All, no, we need to re-rank that, that one. That needs to be re-ranked. Inception. Yeah, definitely Inception. Inception or Alien? <sighs> Man. Wow. That's a, that's a test. Wow. Now, we have to remember, not just it, it's not just because Alien is a bona fide uh, sci-fi horror classic. All right? It is a great film. Mm -hmm. Also, uh, so is Inception. It's a great film. We can't we can't be biased by history, <laughs> right? Can we? Are you are you pushing for Inception? I may then? I may be changing the rules to uh, <laughs> to, to uh, mask my own insecurity. I I'm picking Inception. What? Shock. And it's only because I mean I think they're both. Uh, in my mind, there are both perfect films. The problem with Alien, and it's not even a problem that I think is fair to make this decision on, but some of You're the gonna effects. You're going to say film grain. No, yeah, film grain. No, some of the effects. The effects of of uh, the head when uh, his head is knocked off, it, it looks like a dummy. And also the first time the alien jumps out and it's just like, Boo! I'm a man in the, in the in the shadows. Yeah. Okay. So those are the it's the you. worst reasons. It's the worst reasons to pick. That but is so I mean. I know. I know. It's hard to pick when you're you know battling two virtually perfect films. Well, and here's what we have to say here: that much of this film of Inception were practical effects, as were Alien. Mm -hmm. Practical effects. Man, Granted, is... it was 2010 effects versus yeah. 1979 <laughs> effects, so it's not really a fair comparison. I didn't see a so train it's, it's... running down the, the <laughs> center of that ship. It's terrible uh, of me to use that as my it really uh, basis of judgment, but that's what I did. I'm, I'm gonna, sorry. I'm going to say Inception with you. This was hard. This, I don't. I, no. I feel dirty. Inception or Seven? Seven. Yeah, I. I yeah, I'll go Seven. That was a mind blower for me. Yep. They're both mind blowers. They're but both still. mind blowers, but yeah. But come on, Inception. <laughs> Not that fast. <laughs> Easy now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, number four. Wow. It sure shot up there. Yes. Wow. The top five are Network, Seven, Jaws, Inception, and Alien. It's, you know, it's in good company. I'm and I, telling you, that's a, that's a solid top five. I agree. You cannot go wrong with that top five. Nope. All right. No arguments here. Good. Uh, wait. Okay. Network. Jaws. Seven. Uh, Network 7, which was... What year was uh, 7? That was 90... 95. 5. Mm -hmm. um, and then Alien. Jaws. Jaws. It's... It, yeah. And then... T Alien, Inception. Inception, and Jaws. Or Jaws, Inception. Alien. Alien. That's right. So 1976, 1995, 1975, 2010, and 1979. Man, 2010. Yeah. 
You go, 2000s. <laughs> crack the top five. That's right. All right. Hey, uh, awesome. Where do we go from here? We're changing things up now, right? Yeah, we're, we're going to spend some time with uh, my favorite actor, Tom Hanks. And what are we doing first? We're going to start, we're, we're kind of doing an exploration across the board <laughs> on his career. Well, it's not, I guess 80s and 90s, really, is what we're looking at. We're starting with Splash, his big, uh, not his cinema debut, but certainly the one that uh, made people take notice of him. I have not seen this movie in forever. Yeah. No, really. I mean, I like, really have not wow. seen this movie in forever. It's, well, I mean, no, I've seen it. It's fun to watch, yeah, but not in forever. <laughs> no, really. Like, I hard, I barely remember it. Barely. Forever's a long time, Pete. How often do you watch it? You probably put this on all the time. <laughs> Every other day. <laughs> okay, maybe not that often. I haven't seen it in, it, it's, I don't know, probably been 10 years or so, but yeah, you know, I'm definitely looking forward to it. I'm excited about this. Yeah. John Candy. <laughs> Yeah, good old John Candy and Tom Hanks. They had a they had a thing. They they were in a good couple movies together. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Uh, excellent. Well, I can't wait to do that. And uh, yeah, next week we get wet. Make a splash. That was terrible. <laughs> that, was that was terrible. That was <laughs> that was you know, a double tra- whammy of yeah, terrible. Yeah, right. <laughs> get wet. Make a splash. That was awful. <laughs> wow, that's like oh. on deck to be cut just for <laughs> integrity. Yeah, hopefully we hooked them. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> hey, uh, good talking, Andrew. I got to go to bed. <laughs> All right. It is hard to believe that we have been having in-depth weekly conversations about movies since 2011. So many great conversations over the years about so many great movies. And some stinkers. Well, true. But you know, producing this show week after week requires a ton of work behind the scenes. If you'd like to help support our efforts, one easy way is by using our Originals page when shopping for books and movies that we've covered. Just visit thenextreel.com slash originals. Your purchases made through our links give us a small commission at no extra cost to you and allow us to keep having these great discussions. In season three, we covered even more great adaptations like The Night of the Hunter and It Happened One Night, both part of our Couples on the Run series. We talked about No Country for Old Men, the Coen brothers so rarely adapt someone else's work. We had some fun rom-com adaptations like About a Boy, based on the Nick Hornby novel, and Nick and Nora's Infinite Playlist, adapted from Rachel Cohn and David Levithan's book. In our terribly and naively named foreign language series, we discussed the brilliant City of God and the Diving Bell and the Butterfly, which I won't ever be able to watch again, ever. But could you read the original memoir? I don't know, maybe? We had our Richard Dysart series with adaptations like The Day of the Locust and Being There. Plus, we had that fantastic interview with the man himself. (laughs) The one where we had him sit on the floor? Because this chair was so squeaky. (laughs) Good times. We did our first Tom Hanks series with Forrest Gump adapted from Winston Groom's novel, plus Apollo 13 based on Lost Moon by Jim Lovell. And we did another year series looking at films from 1981, including Das Boot, Gallipoli, and Thief, all based on books. Listeners can dive deeper into all of these original stories and more at thenextreel.com slash originals. Every book, play, movie, video game. Video game. (laughs) You bet. We have talked about some video game adaptations as well. It doesn't matter the source, just follow the link. Every purchase supports the podcast. Check out the full list at thenextreel.com slash originals and get reading, watching, performing, or playing today.